Hey there, this is MJ. While I was reading Peter Pan for Fortress Fiction, or listening to it, I should say, I got about four chapters and I thought, this book is so good, it's so interesting, I don't just want to talk about it in a single episode later on, I want to talk about it a lot. I want to talk about it uh, a minute at a time, maybe. I'll, I'll do shorts talking about it, because it's such an interesting book, it's so dense, there's so much going on, and it's a really weird book, because it's written for children, but it has a very adult perspective, but it's not inappropriate at all, but it does make reference to things that kids wouldn't get or shouldn't get, and it's really interesting the way that it carries itself, the way it presents itself to children. It's very much like an adult telling these stories to the children and almost has interactions like the children are asking questions or wondering about things and the, the speaker is telling them some of the stuff and glossing over other things. And it's really interesting. And uh, I don't know, it's a fascinating story so far. So, uh, one of the things I find most interesting is the characteriz characterization of Mr. or Mrs. Darling, rather, and the idea that she faintly remembers Peter from her own childhood, and she dismisses uh, to Wendy that she could have actually met Peter because uh, Peter Pan would be a man now. He'd be her age. Um, so, I guess he's be he'd be old enough to be her father if it worked that way, but it doesn't. Um, and... Wendy knows somehow that he's not, that he's actually her age and size, it says. And that's uh, interesting. There's other things that are mentioned about how Wendy knows things about Peter or about the goings-on or doings of Peter without really logically being able to understand or be in a position where she knows about them. Like, she's pretty sure that he plays his pipes at the foot of her bed or at the window in the nursery, and she shouldn't know that. She... She's been asleep during these things, and yet, somehow, magically, she knows about it. And it's really interesting. There's a very... I don't know. It's like a very interesting approach to the magic of it all, because there's definitely magical things going on here. And it's... I don't know. It's it's a little bit like... It's a little bit of an absurdist world that Barry's created in, in Peter Pan, but it's also not. It's something more. It's something different, and I don't quite understand what he's doing or, or, or where he's coming from or what his... Uh, I don't know, like, paradigm is that, I don't know what the paradigm is that he's using for this story. So it's interesting. There's a thing about uh, how mothers tidy up their children's minds at night and they like literally get down on their hands and knees and they pull the things out of their kids' minds and then fold them up and tuck them in. And they put the bad stuff at the bottom where it's uh, crammed and hard to reach and they put the good stuff up at the top so it's fresh and ready for the next day. And like, that's a very, like, it's a beautiful and sweet and lovely, lovely idea and a very loving idea, but it also doesn't sugarcoat things. It says that the mothers will hold things up to themselves like a kitten because uh, they adore it. It's so sweet. And then they'll find other things that are abhorrent and they'll you know, push them away from themselves. And that's a really, it's like, I don't know, it's like so absurdist and it's so magical, but it's also very honest and acknowledging reality, uh, the reality of life and how parents will be put off by things that their children do or things that their children say and they'll wonder you know where did they come where did they, that come from in my kid and uh i don't know it's, it's a really interesting like like psychological and like sociological and like really honest examination of things also it's funny like there's other absurdist elements like they weren't sure they could afford to keep the kids and like uh george um darling did all these calculations to figure out if they could keep them and like uh it's wendy john michael michael I think Michael's the youngest. He barely squeaked by, like, they were almost going to get rid of him or something like that, which sounds crazy. And I, I don't know, maybe there's like a darker truth to that, but I think it's just a funny way to put things. Um, and then something else, something else, something else. Uh, oh, Lagnana as the, Lagnana is literally, she's a Newfoundland dog and she's literally their maid. They met her at Kensington Park and she followed them home and she's their maid. Like, she's literally their maid and that's totally normal for them. I mean, it's abnormal. That she has the capacity to be their maid is normal. That she's a Newfoundland dog, and it might be embarrassing uh, for them to have a dog as a maid as opposed to a, a woman, um, is sort of embarrassing. George wonders if it's good for his image, his public image. Um, but she's fully capable to do everything that she needs to do with the children, and she's treated almost as if she's a human. Like she goes and sits with the other human uh, maids or nurses, whatever, um, at school to wait for the children so that she can bring them back home and things like that. And she even like gets the night off and um, the night the children disappear is, uh, well, it's not the night off. That's when, 
Yeah, that's when something else happens. But it's mentioned specifically that Nana, the dog, has a night off where she doesn't have to tend to the children, and Mrs. Darling does instead. And I don't know, it's just like, it's a crazy, absurdist world with lots of magic and lots of whimsy, and it's very interesting. And uh, I don't know, I think it's an impressive feat that very put together, because it all feels really like real and meaningful as well as being very whimsical and magical. So it's pretty interesting. I, I really like this book. This is going to be my second or third time reading through it, listening to the book. Um, and like I said, it was so good that four chapters in, I decided I got to start the book over and talk about it chapter by chapter because it's just too cool not to. I hope you enjoyed that. Go to mjmunoz.com to leave any questions, comments, or other feedback you might have. There you can find all of my analysis, art, and fiction. I cover books, tokusatsu, comic books, anime, and more. Look around, you're sure to find something else that you'll enjoy as well. This has been a Story Over Everything production.